I hate Hillary Duff. I actually had a crush on her, which her breaks my heart to even say this joke. Woo. But still, yeah, woo, Lizzie might be a little too old to know about Hillary Duff. <laughs> 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 you're about to be with it, brother, and you're like, my daughter watched it, hoorah, and that was it. Welcome to another episode of Levity Flowcast. Today we sit down with comedian and podcaster Jeff Fieldhouse. So sit back, relax, and let's flowcast. Um, we look through your Instagram, man. You are very quick-witted. Someone hollered out during one of your shows. Like, like Hillary Duff fit. Uh, yeah. yeah. I find that <laughs> shit Thanks, hilarious. Like, <laughs> Thanks, dude. I mean, so quick. And so where does that, is that something that's just innate with you or you've had to work on? Because we were talking and it was like, how did he come up with I that? I compared it to like being an MC, like freestyling. Mm. Like that's something that, you know, it's so in the moment and so like unhinged yeah. and i was like i can do that but like i could never like if i did comedy i would mm. have a set that i wrote out but yeah. i would not be able to react to people like, mm. I, I don't know how does that work i think it's because something i've been doing within the past like two years is that i'll just say my set out loud from start to finish the whole entire time to drive there mm. to like nothing and it's almost like whenever you study and you have a book report and you just like you want to present it to the class and you keep studying the words, keep studying. When you go up there, you're more in the moment than trying to remember how the words go. So since I've done that bit so many times and I said it exactly how I was going to say it, I say it, he interrupts me. And instead of me being like, well, you can't interrupt me because I need to remember the rest. I'm in the moment enough to be like, well, I know the rest. And what the fuck? You're old. Like, why do you know Hillary Duff? Like, it, even, it took me out of the zone, and I was like, wait, time out, because because I was finally in the moment. Usually, I'm overlooking. I hear a woo, and I'm like, woo, right back to the joke. But instead, I was comfortable enough to be like, wait, what the fuck? Like, it it truly caught me off guard. Where I was like, no, dude, we need to talk about this. This guy was way too old to be like rooting for Hillary Duff in that moment. It was just. It just shows, man, like it, it's, it's skill. There's certain there. Cause like you said, in preparation mm. of just making sure you have your stuff down. I think a lot of people look at creatives and think like, Oh, that's just innately. Mm. That's something. But you talked about going to stand ups or, you know, just open mics, getting started that way. Mm. How do you feel that repetition has helped you? I think even just like you said, that feeling of going up in front of people and I didn't, I'm, I compare it a lot to that, to where I'd imagine, like, since you own this place and, you, like, just going into that tank every single day. I think the reps, mm -hmm. like, if you take a month off, it, you're gonna, you're gonna have those bearings again, even though this is your place. So I just think, just grabbing the mic and even talking in front of people, whether it's like three, twelve, or whatever, it makes you grateful because you'll do a couple open mics, you'll be like, this is depressing, dude. Like, no one's here. Mm -hmm. But I think that makes you so much grateful once you go to the show, and there's a lot of people, and you're like, oh fuck, now this joke's gonna hit. Because at open yeah. mic, you know you have a good joke, but you got to work on it harder. But once you go to that show where there's better people like that show that you saw from that clip, it's like, oh, damn, now this show can breathe a little bit, you know? Makes sense. So, I'm sorry. Uh, no, I was, um, again, like, I see a lot of similarities in, like, comedy and music. How did you develop stage presence? Because mm. I, I think you command a room quite well. <laughs> Never thought about that <laughs> way, buddy, but thank you. I, I mean... <laughs> Listen, I'm a performer too, man. Like, I can see no, these things. 100%. No, thank you, dude. Over repetition, I think that's stage presence and just figuring out what makes me funny to other people. And I noticed just like every single time I'd tell a joke, my brother, my, si like my brother, my sister, and then my girlfriend, I would always send it to them. They're like, you need to act out the characters. They're like, when you're pissed off and you see someone in traffic, you're like acting them out for us. They're like, you need to do that. And I just think like just having more of like that fun side mm. of me is what helps but that doesn't come without like being on stage like a little bit more often but at first i was definitely just like just stiff as a board i so. mean because i can see a growth from like you're you have like five minutes at the arcade comedy yeah, theater yeah. on youtube where mm -hmm. like you talk about being a christmas baby and mm -hmm. the Seven Eleven bit yeah, yeah from like that to the hillary duff set and like the talking about crying in the car like you're just mm -hmm. a lot more animated oh thank you dude i, I really appreciate that because i was i think in like 2018 the 7-Eleven one? Yeah. yeah the, that shit is funny, too. Yeah, thank you, dude. I appreciate that. But no, the, the, exactly your point, like, just taking them there. That was the advice I kept getting from people was just, like, the joke is good, but just take us there. Like, what's an extra thing that can, like, make it more plausible in our brain, you know? So I, I really appreciate that. That said, too, another arm is your podcasting world. When did you start Babyface Assassins, and what got you into that? I believe that we're going on two years now. That's awesome. At the end man. of this year. And it was a... Uh, after I moved back to Pittsburgh from Florida, I uh, started doing an all-art show with my friend Ty, where it's uh, comedy first, music second, and then art third. 
because uh, his girlfriend's an artist, he's a musician, and I do stand-up. And we just wanted to blend it all together, and we knew that we all respect each one, that we wouldn't make it a clusterfuck. Because <laughs> a yeah. lot of people's first thing is like, oh, is the comedy after the music? It's like, no, comedy's always going to be first. It's going to be yeah. a nice appetizer. Mm. And then after, whenever you have the music, people can chill, chill out from the laughter. And then we always have an artist on stage. So, like, I even say it, like, as I'm hosting, like, if I'm bombing, there's a dope-ass artist behind me, okay? <laughs> like, <laughs> enjoy her presence as well. So from doing those shows and hanging out with all these different creatives, we would hang out and just have, like, the dopest conversations after. Mm. And, and they would talk about, like, the wildest shit, and you just see how smart they are mm. and just different perspectives. And I was like, there needs to be a podcast that isn't, like, someone who likes the art talking to the artist. It needs to be, like, two creatives fucking with each other talking. Because mm-hmm. I feel like that just has, like, a cool dynamic. I just wanted that green room effect, which, shout out the green room with Paul Provenza. That, that, that show was, like, awesome, where he has all the comics sitting around and stuff. But, yeah. but yeah, so w- once I had that idea, uh, I moved in with this kid, and he had an extra room. So I asked him if I could use that room to start doing a podcast. And I started doing it throughout that. And then it slowly grew to once I moved in my own apartment, we were doing it out of there. And then What Productions hit me up, and he was like, hey, man, I really like your podcast. Uh, I have a studio. You should be filming it here, not there. And that was a huge next level because – when you come over to my place, I would have all three of my cameras set up the lights, and while I'm interviewing them, I'm making sure that the camera's bleeping red, so like, I can, I can catch yeah. all the stuff. It just it takes you out of the moment. And once I moved to that studio, he would have the camera and lights set up. I'd set up the audio, and when I leave, he put the video on my hard drive, so I could just go home and edit. And it made me a way better interviewer. I like I actually felt like an interviewer and less of like a barista slash like the owner. I felt like an owner that owns like everything where it's like, were you cleaning the toilets? Your meal's almost done. You know, like I just felt like I was doing too fucking much and it looked bad. And it was like in my apartment, I'm letting people in my apartment. And after I'm like, I don't want him to know where I live. Like you just have certain conversations where you're like, what the fuck? You're in my house. Like you just have to like talk to yourself. Like, I know this is a fun hobby, but let's find some outlets. Like let's do something. So it just grew into that, and the more I was doing with music is I just didn't want to put it in a box because stand-up was great. Yeah. But I saw with the all-art show and Babyface, it could reach that vessel to where I'm not a musician. But once I start doing, like, my own shows and uh, music stuff, it, it doesn't seem, like, disgenuous, you know? What do you think is, like, the major relationship between comedy and podcasting? Because with Joe Rogan being, mm. like, the leader of the podcast world and most of the famous comics kind of following yeah. it seems like they lead the niche mm-hmm. i think because when most people want to hear it they just want to either laugh or feel like they're a part of the conversation and like you said i feel like comedians especially when they're together they just have like that tennis effect where it's yeah. constantly mm-hmm. and i think that when you don't have comedians it's a little bit, it's a little bit more of a golf effect with the conversation to where like when you, you kind of only want to tune in when they're on the green and i feel like comedians are on like red zone where you're constantly <laughs> you're going to be hitting some touchdowns so i think that's yeah. pretty much the difference so this is uh since you like do two things both podcasting and comedy what do you see like the future of both of these realms that's interesting i think comedy i could see when people go on the road like how tom's doing that they're going to start like streaming but i also think that stand up's going to go kind of the pot, kind of the mixtape route I see a lot of people going to more half hours and when people are rushing hours, like whenever like Louis CK and those guys dropped like that hour a year and started setting that standard, I think it like set a standard for a lot of other people that shouldn't like it's people like kind of like, I don't know, Lonzo Ball trying to do LeBron James regiment. It's just like different regiments for different players and mm-hmm. it, it kind of rushed this thing to which I think if people dropped like a 15 minutes or like two 15 minutes in a year of what they're feeling during that month, and what that vibe is, I think that's going to be the new start where you're going to see comedian mixtapes of like, hey, instead of dropping an hour a year, I'm going to drop two 15 minutes so you can get that vibe. But also when you see me on the road, you're getting well over than what I would have wasted and could have crafted. So I, I just see that becoming hmm. a little bit more realistic. And then it also makes it better for the comedians because they can be topical as fuck and they can really start like affecting how people feel instead of having a joke. Like there's comedians that will have a Trump joke, but then hold on to it. And now he's out of office. They drop the special. It's dated. <laughs> Like, yeah. it would be yeah. nice to kind of, like, rinse and repeat with, like, 15 to 30 minutes. So I think mm. I see, like, the way people are, like, the palette of comedy, like, the way people are taking it is going to, like, kind of go down. But I think that's going to make it shoot up, you know? Mm-hmm. Definitely. One of the things we like to ask people as we wrap up is kind of a reflective question. If you could hop in a time machine and go back and talk to yourself before you did that first open mic, what advice and things would you say to yourself? 
definitely like repetition. Like definitely repetition. Calm down. <laughs> <laughs> just chill out. And I don't know, but that, I'm just gonna take a second because I feel like you're good. Answers are so rushed, but I don't know, especially before the open mic. I don't know. It sounds so cheesy, but it, it really is like a marathon, not a sprint. Mm. Like a lot of the shit that you expect to see yourself in two to five years isn't like what you're going to see, you know, <laughs> and it isn't what exactly Amen. how you're going to feel. So I think just like trust the process, but also enjoy it. Like remember, and I'd honestly soak up like that inner happiness of like how much fun he's having. Cause after a while you start to not enjoy <laughs> it the same way. So you're like, fuck dude, you're so excited. And like, I'm excited, but it's a different excited. It's like, yeah. I'm not going to fuck up excited, you know, like, so I think just like remaining excited and just, mm. and just knowing like how lucky you are. Like you get to do this. Each open mic you sign up for, you get to go on stage. Not that it's weighing on you. Like I'm going on stage. No, you get to go on stage. So I think that's like a big thing. I want to relax, relax, put my mind at ease. Good friends and good vibes. Now that's all I need. When life hurts, come down and flow to levity. Let your problems wash away into serenity. Whoa.